I'm interested in uh, the child before the researcher, but yeah. the child becomes the researcher. Uh, where is the child, I'm going to arbitrarily say, eight to ten years old? Where is he living? Paris. He's living in Paris, where he was born, I believe. Yes. Um, and his family is composed of, at this point... Brother. A brother. And parents. So they're the two, the two yes. brothers. You're the oldest or the youngest? I'm the oldest. Okay. Um, are both parents employed at this point? At this point, my, my parents have an interesting trajectory. Well, I'm interested. <laughs> so, so my father had uh, studied both in uh, science and biology, and he had done uh, kind of master's level research in biology. Right. And also in philosophy and um, humanities. Uh -huh. And uh, this was the 60s. Yes. And he had, or the end of the 60s, um, he had um, basically dropped out of the system. <laughs> really? And decided to um, join his friends um, who were basically um, hippies and... Uh, smoking pot and yeah, yeah. doing artsy stuff, mm -hmm. philosophy, and he wanted to write a book, which he wrote, but never published. He was already married when he did this. Yes, yes, yes. So, no, of course so, he's married because yes, we... So when I was born, yes. uh, he was doing, he was beginning his, he was doing his uh, university studies. Uh, um, okay, so... Both he, of my parents were at university when I was born. I and see. As it unfortunately happens, you know, happened in those days, my mother dropped out of university. Yes, because, yes, uh, because I, I was born in March, and uh, she basically stopped everything there, right. and they didn't go to her exams or anything. And basically, right. that's that was it for her university career. Um, but but he continued, and um, and so my brother and I were raised in an environment where. Um, we were told, for example, that it was the parents who had to learn from the children rather than vice versa, which at that time, you know, was... But particularly in France. Yes, yeah, so, but, but you have to put it in the context, but, you know, 1968 yes. is the French uh, revolution in the street with the I students. I was living in Paris then. I know so, exactly. Yes. So it, these ideas were in the air. These ideas were in the air, exactly. So they were part of that. They were in the street. Uh, yes. <laughs> and um, and also, so it, it's interesting because both um, uh, my, my, my father had both this inclination towards rejecting the norm and the, the, the capitalist system and right. the um, religion and uh, things like this. And uh, he was very interested in finding a meaning in his life. Uh, he was very interested in science as well because, uh, and he taught us that knowledge and science were very important. Yes. Um, and so both my brother and I quickly um, uh, developed a strong skills in, in math and, and science early on. I'm going to be very literal. Are books around the house? Are, are lessons being given you specifically? Yes. Is, is there a consciousness in their raising of you? Yes, yes. So, so my father was always talking philosophy. Yes, and, okay. And uh, uh, Spinoza was his master. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask the question I wouldn't ask of an American. Uh, is there a class consciousness? Are they bourgeois? Are they haute bourgeois? So are they, they working they class? They come from the bourgeois, you know, lower bourgeois class. Okay. And they both rejected the very strong um, Jewish Moroccan tradition that they came from. They moved away from their parents to be in, in Paris and, ah. and be free. <laughs> Yes. From that uh, very tight rule that uh, was the norm in, in their culture. So, so there's that origin where mm, feeling free to experiment new things and uh, very strong humanist values and a respect for truth and science, okay, I think have important. had a big influence on, on, on me. 
Yeah. And I'm guessing only from comments you've made in some of the uh, interviews I've read, uh, you're not rebellious against that. Quite the opposite. They're the, they're doing the rebellion. Yes, yes. and it's, you're the new the yeah, new way right. of thinking. That's right. So 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 my parents had to fight against the culture in which they were born right. in order to find their you know who they they needed or wanted to be. Whereas I didn't have to fight against authority. Yeah, yeah. I they, was given a lot of you. freedom, and so I was feeling quite good in being, you know, um, uh, part of the successful young kids yeah. in school, whereas they were uh, rejecting a lot of that. Would, would, would they, maybe I'm thinking specifically of the tradition you came, but it's a more general question. Were they ambitious for you or have not at all? Have you not at not all? Not at all. Not at all. Um, I don't know where I have taken my ambition. I guess my mother probably has stimulated my sense of um, wanting to achieve, to um, to 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 become um, uh, to get recognition. She, I think she 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 did. Hope for that, maybe. She, yeah, and 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 more than that, she she um, she praised m my intelligence when I was two I, years old, okay. right? Okay. So I was always raised as a genius already before. Right. Okay, uh, very interesting. I even got to school, which didn't hurt your confidence. Which I think <laughs> has had an impact and allowing me to uh, express my ideas. Yes. Uh, to not be afraid of going against the trend and fashion and feel confident to follow my intuition, my scientific intuition. I'm going to use their generation and actually conversations that I've had with other laureates to ask you, still in an interesting way, this did not seem to be uh, being raised against authority. It's not, it's not just saying, be perverse. No. Don't do what others no, tell you that's to right. do. No, it was more be yourself, right? Be yourself. Exactly. Don't fight the world if you don't want to, that's, but be yourself. And that, that was the uh, counterculture of the 60s and 70s. Right? Although there was a lot of broad statements about authority and power yes, and yes, so forth. Yes. But, but in the direct sense, yeah. you so were what not... What I got out of this was yes, be free. Yeah. Right. And clearly that has helped me. Did your school help you, or was most of the motivating and thinking happening at home? Um, school helped me. Um, I had a always, most of the time, I had a very, very positive relationship with the, the, the teachers. Mm -hmm. um, I, and again, that helped to bring, bring, uh, build up my confidence as well. Right. But strangely enough, at the same time as I had this very good relationship with teachers, uh, I had a very poor relationship with the other students. This is not unknown, by the way. <laughs> Sometimes it's called teacher's pet. But, yes, uh, it was, and that's how the other students treated me. And I was shy uh -huh. and very socially inept. Mm -hmm. uh, the typical nerd kind yes, of yes. thing. I spent my time in the library reading books and not being able to uh, enjoy interacting with others, yes. other children. And it continued throughout adolescence. Really? Yeah. A terrible time to be lonely. Absolutely. I found my adolescence very painful. Yes. Yes. Because at the same time, I, you know, I had the urge to be with a group yes. and that's just it's natural. You know, that's natural. And to meet uh, women and yes, girls. Also natural. But I couldn't. Yes. Um, and so, but it eventually worked. I mean, I, I, I did uh, manage to connect to other people in my late teens and uh, early 20s. And I was lucky. I, I could have, you know, become a loner and so on. And I ended up um developing my personal abil relationship abilities uh i ended up having children fairly young yeah, uh, as did your parents as did my parents 
And so it taught me a lot emotionally. So mm -hmm. I was really emotionally uh, uh, EQ of uh, peanuts yeah. in the early time <laughs> of my life. <laughs> right. But in the 20s and 30s, I grew, I think, uh, in a good part, thanks to my, uh, my relationship with, with uh, women and, and my children. And, and then with colleagues, right? As I became um, a professor, I I'm, I, I'm sorry. I'm I'm going to save that point for later, That's mostly fine. because That's I'm fine. also interested in the question of collaboration, not just yes, yes, the yes, social yes. level, but the but 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 there's been this progression. So I've been a late comer to humanity, if you want. Yes, yes. Um, interesting enough, as you speak in uh, various uh, contexts I've read, um, you're very humane in the articulation of things. So that comes across. I can learn. <laughs> uh, you did uh, in spades. But that being said, um, I'm now searching for, I may not find him or her, a mentor in your formal education. Is there somebody seeing you? I mean, you're, you're clever, you know it, your teachers presumably know it, but is there somebody who becomes significant? I'm just going to say in high school. Uh, not at that stage. Not at that stage. No. So no one I would say my say... first real mentor has been Jeff Hinton and Jan Lequin to some extent. Really? Yes. So that's much later. So you, you wait for a mentor, yeah, I, so to speak. I mean, yeah, you're not yeah. consciously. So I, I had a thesis advisor and I had a good relationship with him. Yeah. But I don't think I... I had a mentor-mentee relationship. He, uh, we had a lot of discussions and so on, but basically the field that I chose was out of his area. Ah, but, but we're now at graduate level? Have yes, we gone, yes, we've yes, jumped yes, to graduate? I, I've jumped, what I mean, but there was nothing in between. Uh, but nothing in between, no, that's really, no. so you're still having to make the decisions I'm a loner. Yes, I'm of a, a student. Yes. Um, how yes. are you deciding where to go, what you want to do? That's right, so I can talk about that. Yes. Uh, in the mid-adolescence, Yes. Uh, my brother and I uh, get acquainted with programming okay. at the time when computers didn't have anything on them but just like basic so you can program and that's right. it right uh, there were no games that you could right. uh, or we didn't have the money for that and so we're in the late 70s we're in the uh, late 70s exactly yes. around 1980 okay Okay. And so around 1980, we get our first um, computer. In fact, I, my first computer is not a computer. It's a calculator. I get a calculator because I need it for school. And I realize I can program it. And so I learned to program on a TI-58C, uh, which is like assembly language. It's very difficult, but, and you can't do much. There's no, but, but that's how I learned. And then I learned, uh, and, and about the same time, we, we, we bought a, a, a and a Atari 800 and then an Apple IIe. So we as the family. We as my brother and I. Your brother. And yes, because my family didn't have any money. Ah. So uh, my brother and I worked uh, part-time, okay. like uh, uh, passing the, the newspapers and, and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, for this purpose. For this purpose. Okay. Um, and uh, we then go to New York. We were living in Montreal at that mm -hmm. time. We go to New York to buy computers because they were cheaper than in Montreal in those days. Um, and, uh, and this is basically what has meant that at the end, when I had to take a decision about go to physics or math exactly. versus computer science, I end up you know, closer to computer science. Are you even able to make that decision in terms of the direct academic options available? To yeah, you? yeah. So I mean, I had good grades, and I could. Oh no, I don't mean in terms of your abilities. I'm in terms of what is available in schooling. Uh, well, so there was no computer science before university then. But, right. But by the time we enter university, we already know how to program very well because we just learned by ourselves, right? Yes. Um, and you, you're in Montreal now, I think, because we're interested in your so life. So 12 years old is when I come from France with, I mean, my family comes to Montreal from France. Oh. And so basically my adolescence is, is here in Montreal. Is here in Montreal. That's right. Why do they come? They come because they are looking for a better world. Um, okay. My mother's parents live here. Ah. And So the family uh, has a history here. Yes, 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 yes. So my grandparents had come here maybe 10 years earlier or something. I see. Yes. And, um, and I guess the, they're hoping for a more open and welcoming society. 
Right. Uh, France at that time is somewhat still, I mean, I guess still today, um, uh, divided in uh, harboring racist uh, huh? tones. And they were feeling that? Yes. yes. Personally or just objectively not liking such uh, a society? My mother told me stories. Huh? Yeah. You're, okay. the, you're the Jew or you're Moroccan, I mean, whichever. Yeah, but you were <laughs> an other category. That's right, that's right. But no, I don't think they... It hurt them a lot, but they, you know they could feel. They just that, didn't like. Yeah, the, the and 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 coming here as a visitor, coming here in North America, they yeah. had the impression that it was a much more uh, open and, and welcoming society, okay. and it was true. Yeah. Uh, now let's look at if there are them intellectual uh, moods as opposed to social moods. Yeah, yeah. Um, was there a, a sense for them, or maybe you and your brother as you're growing up, that there was more intellectual, I'm gonna call it adventurism, uh, but you know what I mean, uh, a wider way to think about things than in France. And I may be dealing with cliches, the notion that there was a way to do things in France and maybe a freer framework here, but I could be wrong. Yeah, so uh, in general, I think it has changed now, but in those days, in those days, in those days, Europe in general was much more segregated in its uh, economic uh, classes. Okay. Um, there's a good reason why Marxism, you know, came out there. Right. And uh, in those days, there was the impression that North America was much more a place of opportunity, and where people with motivation and, and skills could could um, have a good life. I, I, maybe I'm interjecting too much of my own experience when I was in France at that yeah, point. Yeah. Uh, just the notion that French people uh, expressed to me that what they liked, this yeah. particular uh, group, about America at that point was that when you come up with a new idea, they would say to me in France, people tell you why it doesn't work. That's the first right, impression. Right, right, right. Uh, not that this is intellectually yes. bankrupt. As a, Criti a, a critique is the French sport. It's not only critique, I was told. It was the notion that you start with, in general, why it can't work uh -huh. because tradition has always said it is this way. Right, right. But yeah, so, it, so there's also a, a more friendly interaction, uh, less formal here in Quebec, especially. Yes, okay. Um, it's a society where um, people can easily um, reach out to each other. And it's like almost compared to France, it gives the impression of being in a village, right? Okay. Where uh, interactions are easier and people will give you a chance. So freedom is happening at a lot of levels. Yes, so to yes, speak. yes. It's not yes, just yes, an economic yes. issue. That's right. That's right. Um, how do you pick a university? Um, you're already programming. Right. Uh, so I pick McGill because I wanted to improve my English. Yes. And uh, the, I thought immersion was the right way. And yes. it was true. <laughs> <laughs> and that was true. <laughs> and um, But that was not because they had a particularly good computer program. No, or... in fact, they didn't. I mean, so they, the strong computer science program was at UD, UDM, University of Montreal, oh. which had been there for a long time. They only had a graduate program in computer science. Oh. And so I went to the computer engineering program. Anyway, these are details, but... No, 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 uh, no they're important. But uh, it, it also satisfied my... Uh, so I had always been interested in physics. Uh, initially, oh. I thought I would, would not, I would do math and physics, which yes. is sort of, you know, the, the thing that is regarded as uh, right. intellectually superior, right. <laughs> wrong, wrongly. Um, and I thought, but if I did computer engineering, and, and indeed, I, I had a lot of uh, physics courses, and there were a lot of aspects that you don't touch in computer science. And so I had a broader training, which ended up being actually, by chance, uh, useful for machine learning, the, the, my area of science because the kind of math that we do in yes. machine learning is more like the kind of math you do in engineering and, and, and physics, and less like the kind of math that you do in computer science, okay, which is discrete math. Whereas, whereas uh, in physics and engineering, you do a lot of continuous math. This was, not, this was not planned, obviously, uh, but it turned out well. Yeah, it's an influence. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, so I haven't been able to find a mentor yet yes. so because you're an undergraduate. Yes. And you're still... Looking for my way. Looking for your way. Yes. Um, 
you're, my guess is you're doing all right as an undergraduate. Yes, yes, yes. Very, very well. Uh, yeah. Recognized as yes. able, yes. presumably. Yeah. Um, so you're going to finish your undergraduate. At what point are you decided on a, a doctoral, a next stage? So I did uh, work during my summers. Remember, my parents didn't have a lot of money, so yes. I worked during the summers. But I get pretty good jobs. Like uh, I work at the, the Ottawa's National Research Council, and then I work at um, IBM uh, that had facilities here. So you're not waiting tables. These are jobs yeah, in yeah, the yeah. summers yeah, that yeah. contribute to your, That's right. That's yes, right. your development. But, but by doing those jobs, I also realized that the kind of job I could easily get in industry wasn't what I wanted and that okay. I wanted to continue towards research. Right? Which is a quite an important decision. That's I mean, right. maybe later I, on. I did hesitate a little more. bit, but I quickly decided this was, because I got job offers at the end of undergrad. I, I would just assume so, because this is just when the industries are beginning to yes, know yes, what they need. Yes. And yes. Um, was this, and again, I'm asking, so to speak, about a very young man who's also trying to figure out himself in the world. Yeah. yeah. But um, is there a strong decision that an academic life is preferable for a number of reasons, intellectual or moral, or is it just a happenstance? Um, it's in between. So I had an intuition that this is, was more like what I wanted, but yeah. I couldn't say that it was like thought out and I had a long argument in my, with myself. And the hippie parents' background in you is not saying, don't join the capitalist system. No, I mean, it's nothing I, formal. I, no, I, wasn't, I don't think I was influenced by that. Uh, it was more like um, I, uh, I felt more attraction to continuing my exploration. And, um, Which the, would be less constrained than right, academia. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Um, and then, uh, while I'm doing the the graduate courses for the masters, right. I start reading papers about neural nets. Okay. Um, you start because somebody pointed you in that no, direction. No, uh, it's just that in you know in the course of uh, the graduate courses, you 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 have projects to do. And I read all kinds of things. And in the class, the first class where I encountered this was a class that was about um, actually computer architectures and parallelism, which seems very far away. But then I realized there's all this thread of people talking about um, uh, parallel computation in the brain yes. and how we might emulate it or get inspired by it. And that's how eventually I fall on the papers of, of Jeff Hinton. Now, as I spoke to him not so long ago, um, he talked a little bit about how psychology was one of those fields on his way. Yeah, not me. To, not you I at all. I got to psychology later. You got to psychology later. Yeah, much later. At this point, you're, you're following a kind of technical intuition? Well, so, okay, so, so what happens when I start reading those papers is I discover psychology and neuroscience. I, I knew nothing about those fields. Right. But of course, the, the neural net uh, idea that I discovered, and it's, it's an old idea from the 50s that yes. we, we should well, build things Turing. like this. That's from right, Turing. that's right. Yes. Um, so I start reading these papers and I, I, it, it just echoes something very strong in me about what is intelligence. Okay. So and now let me tell you something very personal. Please. Which I guess is the purpose of this, these yes, interviews. Yes, yes. Um, my mother was always telling me, you are intelligent, you are intelligent, blah, 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 blah. And I kind of, uh, okay. Um, but but it, it sort of, it stayed in me no, it was too much, yeah, you know? <laughs> it stayed in me that, like, what is this? What is, what is intelligence? What are you, yeah, what are you saying I, about me? She's saying that I have this thing. Yes, but what is it? What is it? I, like, I wanted to understand. It was and not suddenly, enough that a mother knew. No, <laughs> and, and suddenly, you know, I read these papers. I, I'm a computer scientist. I, I, I understand math and programming. Yes. And then suddenly, oh, there's a connection with the brain. And people talk about intelligence and artificial intelligence. And I start reading about AI. And of course, let me go back maybe five years earlier, yes. 10 years earlier, in pretty much all of my adolescence, I start reading science fiction novels. 
and they feed <laughs> my dreams and my uh, sort of uh, imagination about what computers could become in the future. And right, but, what but at that be? time, I hadn't made the connection with brain and and, and yes. neural nets. It's just when I start reading these papers, these two threads connect. Right, well. uh, my. Uh, adolescent dreamy thoughts about AI that I just got from science fiction. Yes. And um, and suddenly that, you know, there's a scientific field which is asking what is intelligence in a way that could inform us about our own intelligence, animal intelligence, yes. and machines that could have intelligence as well. Right. And for me, that was like a revelation. Yes. And basically, I would say it, it was a turning point. So, you know, that was like a watershed moment. Right, and has built throughout your whole career. That's right. So yeah. your intuition was right about, about where to go. Yeah, but we have to be humble that uh, it could also be wrong. And uh, in a way, I was lucky that those thoughts came and I, I chose this path. I could have chosen something else. But you also don't seem, and again, this is an impression based on uh, what I've learned about you, uh, you don't seem to be over worrying about the path that you want to go being the wrong path. Yeah, I mean, you're, no, that's, but that's the heritage of uh, freedom, right? Which I've tried to give to my children as well. Oh, yes? And I think we should do more of that. In, 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 and I think we, we are doing a lot more of that today than, than in the 60s when I was born. So don't be afraid of being wrong. That's right. That's right. right. And it's important for science. It's important for innovation. It's important for having a better uh, uh, public service bureaucracy. I mean, it's everywhere that we need to do a better job of uh, allowing people to take responsibility for their actions and fail and try and not be afraid of uh, making a mistake. Which will stand you in good stead with later premises and moods in, in science. But right now, uh, I'm still desperate to find you a mentor. You say it's going to be Hinton. Yes. Is that... But that comes only um, uh, seven years later. Seven years later. So... Yeah, so, but it, before that, so I do my PhD. Well, in a sense, I have a first mentoring experience with the, my thesis advisor. Right, right. Uh, Renato de Mori, okay. who studies speech recognition. And he had been doing it using fairly classical AI methods, and he was starting to get interested in statistical methods, like hidden Markov models. This is a technical term, but mm -hmm. what matters is, uh, before I go to see him, I, I have uh, to ask him to be my advisor. I have in hand, um, something really important, which is the, the Canadian government gives out these uh, scholarships to good undergrad who are going to go to grad studies. And so essentially, uh, my, my, my grad studies are paid by this. Mm -hmm. So if I go to a professor, I'm going to cost him zero. <clears throat> and so since I had already decided I want to do neural nets, um, I looked at who are the professors at McGill and yes. who might be interested in this. Yes. And he's the closest approximation to what I need. And so I, we talk together and we find a common ground. Like basically, I would do neural nets for speech recognition. And it's not something he knows about, but he's interested in learning more. And, and I would apply you know, my, my work. I would test my ideas on the thing that he cares about and on which he has knowledge. So it was a good deal. And he was very generous with me, sending me to conferences already, so I was productive. Yes, And yes. so I, I went to multiple conferences per year. Are you publishing at all at I'm, this point? I'm publishing very quickly, and so I'm going to the first uh, Europe's conferences. Yes. Uh, um, and that has had a huge impact on me, because then I connect to other people who have the same interests as me. Right. Right. And that's where I get to know in, uh, the, the sort of the French mafia of neural nets. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which includes Jan Lequin and others like Leon Botou, who have been friends, mentors, uh, also people like uh, Patrick Hafner, uh, Isabelle Guillon, which later uh, uh, I joined as part of a postdoc at Bell Labs. So I, I joined a lot of these people who ended up together 
Uh, so a lot of people who have the same interests as me speak yes. the same language yes. and go to the same conferences yes. and are pretty you know, progressive minded as well. So it was like a, something that uh, created a very strong um, connection that lasts to these days. What is, what is at this point, it's going to be perhaps even more relevant in the 90s, but at this point, the intellectual This is the early 90s uh, yeah, when we I are to already. LX, but, but during my PhD, I'm still fairly um, alone and starting to connect with those people. So during my PhD, I see them in conferences. There's, because we speak the same language, we kind of naturally congregate and uh, talk to each other, influence each other. Uh, is it, I don't really mean is it romantic, but is it um, accurate to call you rebels? Because this is still not an accepted strategy for thinking about uh, machines. To some extent. So in the bigger picture of AI, yes. uh, in the late 80s, early uh, 90s, neural nets and what would become machine learning is still a very marginal thing. Right. Um, the the Neurips conference is uh, maybe 200 people, whereas the triple AI, uh, AI conference is thousands of people. Yes. Uh, now, of course, today, the, there were 20,000 people who wanted to buy a ticket for Neurips. Only 13,000 were lucky enough to get one. Right. And AAAI has maybe, a, I don't know, in, in 1,000, 2,000 kind of. So right. It's a profound shift. It's a profound shift. And you're involved in that shift. Yes, That's yes. So I'm, I'm there at the beginning when this movement starts, not yes. quite as early as uh, people like, like Jan and Jeff. Um, and... But the good thing, which actually comes back later in my career, yes. is even though it's a small group, it's a group that is very, has a lot of solidarity, okay? We stick together, we organize our own conference, like Neurips is sort of our community. Yes. It's separate from the standard thing. And so we get moral support from the like-minded people, even though there might not be a lot of them. I get the moral support part. What about financial support? If you're going against the trends, is, is, is there financing to support your work? Um, you're going to need a lot of money. So later, in, uh, when I become a professor and I have to worry about financing, um, I'm lucky because living in Canada, being a professor in Canada, we uh, benefit from a very socialist system of uh, distribution of funding. So okay. I would say it's a, it, it, it has two parts. There's like almost everyone gets a bit of money and then a few people get a lot of money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I've benefited both ways, right? Uh, when I was working on something unknown, I, I got enough money. So for example, the, the, the scholarship that I got, they didn't care what I wanted to study. They just, really? if you're good, you really? get money. And, and similarly, when I was a young professor, I got, you know, fairly good uh, funding, but, you know, not, not, not outstanding um, because uh, it's a discovery, uh, curiosity-based research funding. Uh, you're astonishing me. I mean, it's... This is how Canada this is, works. This is, a this good is why thing. we're leading in AI. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, because normally there's a priesthood who are asked every time a young uh, individual, but also idea comes. And if they don't think that this is worth pursuing, the money doesn't come. Well, there, there is some of that effect, but I think it's much less. Ah. So the, the okay, emphasis- Okay, this is very emphasis, good to know. Yeah, yeah. Very good to know. So this is not a problem for you. You're, no. you're getting, you're forming a community That's of like-minded right. people. Yes. You're inspiring each other, and you're yes. determined in the face of yes. those who say nonsense. But, but actually, what happens also in the early 90s is there's a beginning of uh, interest uh, towards AI and neural nets from industry. Ah. So this, this, this is like the, the, the second wave or whatever of neural nets, where uh, there's a... Because after backprop was invented, or at least uh, revealed... Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's a good word. Um, uh, you know, people start realizing that it works. Uh, not at the scale that we know today, uh, but it creates a lot of expectations and, 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 you know, and then some companies try to oversell it and there was a first wave of hype, right. which eventually dies in the, in the mid-90s. Um, 
but um, that has contributed to when I was a professor, uh, companies coming to me and say, oh, we want to apply neural networks to whatever X, Y, Z. And so I get, a, I get acquainted with uh, how university and industry can work together fairly early on in my career. And of course, then when I do my postdoc at Bell Labs, but it's a very different kind of um, relationship. Mm -hmm. Bell Labs at that time is like the Google research of today. Yes, yes. It's yes. very academic. Right. Um, what I'm not hearing yet, and I really don't know because I was not in the field at that point or now, I can see the intersections growing between industry and academia. I can see um, the uh, approach you are taking as a group more and more gaining attention and uh, legitimacy. What I'm not yet hearing and haven't heard from others is much discussion across um, study. Uh, what I mean is psychology coming into right, it. Right, right, are, the, right. are, are, are you in your search for intelligence talking to people in the humanities are, or right. are you talking to right. yourselves? Right. So good, good question. So um, from the beginning, the NeurIPS, NIPS as it was called then, community that I, I mentioned, the conferences where, the main conference where I was going and I'm still going and I'm on, on the board of, is multidisciplinary. It's okay. founded by people from all corners, not just computer scientists. Okay. So mathematicians, physicists, of course, computer scientists, but also cognitive psychologists, neuroscientists, um, not so much, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, philosophers at that time, very little. I'm wondering about the philosophers because they should be a little bit interested. Yeah, yeah, there was in, some interest. In intelligence. Yes, 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 yes. And mind, right? Uh, <laughs> the mind. Part of philosophy. Exactly. Um, and and uh, the tradition, that tradition, I've made it mine. Yes. And... Um, as an organizer of conferences and so on, I've always yes. continued to seek that. So unfortunately, the, the community has changed to be much more homogeneous. So today, oh. at NeurIPS, it's like 90% computer scientists or computer engineers or whatever, something very close. Um, the neuroscientists we, who used to be a big part of it have... Yes spinned off their own conference in the 90s really called cosine and there there remains a little bit of cognitive neuroscience and cognitive science but mostly uh we create the we we kept the connection through um a, 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 you know a voluntary effort of bringing those people in to give invited talks at our at our conferences okay and i organized several conferences uh and we have this, uh, well, for many years, and, and, and we continue to do that, and I think it's very important. Um, and today, I'm interested in research topics where the input of people who study the brain, including of philosophers, is uh, very important, and connecting to consciousness, which we can talk about yes, later. Yes, yes. I, I, I'm wondering if there is enmity, so I'm going even to the extreme of this question yeah. because it may not even be a valid yeah, yeah, yeah. and that is that um, in the science fiction of today which is where we read in, in the journalism of today yes. because AI, and AI is now everywhere in yeah, discourse yeah. that's right um, the more fashionable that's the wrong that's almost a cynical word uh, the, the more current of the approaches has to do from outside the field with the fear of it there's an immense amount right. of fear as though, which is an odd combination, it seems to me, of trusting actually that you're onto something. Yeah, but that's a new phenomenon. It's a new phenomenon. It's a new, it's, I would say it's in like in the last three, four years that people really start being concerned about the negative aspects of technology, science, uh, I mean, in particular AI and... Uh, yeah, both short-term, long-term, and, and, and I've been involved in those discussions a lot. As well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the whole question of the protection, it seems to me, of the humane way of thinking about yeah. what makes a human being, yeah. and the idea, and of course, Jeff Hinton is one of those right. who's so, perfectly prepared right to away, say... So, uh, you know, Jeff Hinton played a big role in oh, this. Okay, He let's, let's cares about this. as much, really as much, 
and maybe even more about how the brain works than how to build intelligent machines. Ah. Yes. And, and that has had a profound influence on me. So you are, are on that side yes, yes. Of, of the inquiry. Yes. In a way, I don't care about building the next gadget. I want to understand intelligence. That's what got me into this field. Yes. Right? That's what emotionally has been driving me for all those years. What, what is it? What is intelligence? Right. From, for a long time, yes. since your mother called you intelligent. That's right. Well, <laughs> yeah. At that time, I didn't understand anything. But, <laughs> but so it's, it's as much a philosophical drive or yes, whatever we yes. want to go. But, but it's important to realize that for many years, this um, ideal of looking for uh, a synergy between brain sciences and artificial intelligence has been a minority thing. It was important in the initial community of neurons, but very quickly it became so technical, so uh -huh. mathy, that it drove away the, 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 the non, you know, mathy yes. people. Yes. Um, so, uh, Jeff, Jan, and I, it started with Jeff, um, but we were all together at the beginning, mm. created an organ, uh, uh, a research program, a, mm -hmm. a particular kind of organization under the auspices of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research called CIFAR. Not to just call it CIFAR, uh, which brings together top scientists on both sides of the equation, the brain side and the, the computer side. That started in 2004, roughly. Um, and we continue this tradition. So there's, there's been um, really a strong will to maintain the connection between those two communities. And I have contributed papers, not just on the AI side, but also on the, the, the neuroscience side, like how taking the things that I've learned in AI and coming up with theories about how the brain works, essentially. Right. And I think this will continue. I think uh, it, it, mostly the transfer of knowledge has been from brain sciences to AI, because this is the inspiration, right? Right. But I think we are already witnessing a reverse arrow, uh -huh. okay. where the ways of thinking that we have in machine learning can become inspiration, suggested theories, um, validation tools for brain sciences. And, and there are some neuroscientists who feel this strongly. That's right. Strongly. There is a community in neuroscience today, it's yeah. very new because of the success of deep learning, that yeah, yes. is really embracing this uh, vision. What, again, this is an impression that asks for either validation or rejection. My impression is that um, we actually know more about intelligence than we used to, certainly, uh, that the, the problem is or isn't that we can't make machines replicate it. In, in other words, it's not, it isn't the same question as I'm understanding. What is intelligence? We might m know it, m we might know more what intelligence is and still not able to replicate it in machines. Well, if we really understood intelligence in, in living beings, you think we, we should. should be able to build it as well. This ah. is real understanding. You can build it. If you understand it, you can build it, right? Uh -huh. I mean, barring some technical obstacles, like yes. maybe we can understand the sun, but we can't build one. Um, but in this case, there's no reason. Your brain is a computer, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, not those same kinds of computers that we use today, but right. it is a machine that computes. Yes. And it has randomness in it, and it's just very complex, and we don't completely understand it. It's been evolved, which means it's a mess. <laughs> Evolution is, you know, yeah, yeah, it's uh, not... not going in a straight lines. Right. Um, at one point, I, I overheard, in the sense that I read about about you and some of your ideas. I overheard um, you're saying that machines now, and it, this appeals to a layman, are sort of we're not even at the two year old not stage. Even. Uh, I think you said maybe the higher primates machines mm, are not even not there. even I think not uh, even well so so 
before I answer this question, yes. I need to say that there's a misconception about intelligence, okay. which is that it's like a one-dimensional thing, like IQ. This is wrong. Okay. Um, we all know that you can be good at some things and bad at other things. Yes, Lord knows. <laughs> and they're all intelligent just on different problems. Right, different So one way I, I, I put it sometimes is, if I were to put you in the body of a mouse right now, yes. you would die very quickly I of hunger and mouse. you would be eaten by the next cat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So, so that mouse has the intelligence of doing the he right she things needs. she needs in her right. ecological niche. Right. And you have the intelligence of surviving in your social niche. Right. And, you know, within the human spectrum, we know that, you know, uh, some people can be very intelligent musically, for example, yes, and, and very stupid uh, emotionally or whatever. Right. So, what was your question again? Because uh, it was connected to that. Um, well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's just a question of, you've corrected my question okay. uh, in a way that I appreciate because I was just saying, what do what can machines do now? Oh, right, right, right. And you use, is it primate? Yes. Is it right, two-year-old right. oh, that right, you're saying? Right. No, so it's the wrong way of thinking. It's the wrong way of thinking. Uh, we have machines that can beat a human at the game of Go. Yes. But that's all they can do. Yes. And um, hopefully we'll get machines that have a broader form of intelligence, more similar to ours. Right. But, but it's very possible that in, in the end we'll build, or in, in the coming years, we'll build machines that are very good at some cognitive tasks yes. and, re and humans remain, you know, much superior in other cognitive tasks. Eventually, there's no reason to believe that we won't be able to build machines that will be as good, at least, as us on every cognitive tasks. But the, uh, that's because we will push on all those fronts. Right. Um, and we will lose the mystical sense of our specialness as human beings. Um, I have already lost it. <laughs> Um, I think so is uh, Jeff Hinton. Um, now I'm going to ask um, uh, another contextual question because uh, you, you're the one to ask, and that is that we have noticed that certain places in the world there have been a concentration of effort, actually insight, achievement, and other places not. You can argue in some places it's not surprising they don't have the structure and so yeah. forth, but um, you've spoken interestingly about Europe, and for obvious reasons, you know it, you interact with it, but it has always seemed to me a mystery that Europe is, whether we say behind or not, so less involved given its intellectual traditions and so forth. What, what is not going on in Europe, or maybe it's changing yeah, now? I think it's changing. I'm, I'm hoping uh, and I see signs that Europe may be catching up, but there are still some some structural problems. Okay. What? Are... Well, mostly in the scientific arena, Europe is um, is relying on very rigid institutions, where there's a very deep hierarchy, and where individual researchers don't have as much freedom, which was the thing we started with. Yes. Um, and um, that's that's slowing them down. And uh, it's uh, not a matter, and it may be also a matter, but it's not a matter of money uh, invested in. Well, that could be part of it sometimes. In countries like France, or even worse, uh, in Southern Europe, researchers typically don't get paid very much. They don't get support. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think it's more than that, yeah. You know, you know when you were <laughs> being born, yes. uh, Jacques Monod got the uh, Nobel Prize uh, roughly the mm -hmm. time you were being born mm -hmm. uh, in uh, bio, uh, what's his, his field is in biology, but I can't remember the particular macrobiology, I think. And he was celebrated in France. I know this because I was involved with yeah. France. I had, and he got up and he said, celebrate me, celebrate France, but this never would have happened without support I got from outside of France. Mm. He made a very bold, even shocking 
right. statement at the time didn't seem to have changed things. But um, but I, I think things are changing in Europe, though. So there's uh, a better understanding of these uh, structural uh, weaknesses. Um, governments are much more proactive than, say, in the U.S. in terms of uh, being willing to strategically invest in areas like AI. Um, and there's a good is you know, probably uh, one of the best education systems in the world uh, across the different countries and universities. Um, so I'm, I think it's very important that AI develops not just in Silicon Valley and Beijing. Exactly. And so as part of the things I care about is helping other areas of the world develop. Of course, here at home, this is, you know, you always have a duty to your home, you have your own yes, community. Yes, of course, of course. But, but also abroad in Europe, of course, but also in places like Africa and the developing countries who have a huge potential. Uh, of course, they have to build up their education system, but they can bypass a lot of the wasted time. We, we, we know a lot more today. There's the internet, which means that I see African mm. students, for example, who learn by themselves on the internet. In a way, that's not very different from the way I learned by going to the library right, when I was young. Right, right. right. So and now it's you the can same be thing. Far away from the centers and so, so access. One, one thing I didn't mention when I was in high school is I got, I was bored to hell. Right. I learned more in libraries than going okay. to classes. Classes were boring, uh, and so I can imagine a lot of intelligent with a lot of potential people. I, I don't just imagine, I, I ask them to come here and do internships right. and, and learn and network. So, so yeah, I think uh, well, their, their we should have a positive them. outlook on uh, the democratization of knowledge in general, but, but of, of AI uh, expertise in particular. We have to as, work towards that. As, as we come to the end of this, I, I want to still push you a bit maybe yeah. just because of, of my not understanding, and say that we, we earlier talked about the question of not having a problem failing in the process yes. of achieving something. Yes, yes, yes. Isn't it true that many national systems, even with support, yeah. even with certainly the intelligence that we know is everywhere, yeah. and the capability of research is everywhere, uh, but the intolerance of failure. Yeah. Is, is that, that is fair something, to say? Well, I don't know. I'm not studying these things. No, 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 no. But, no. but I sense you're right. Uh, I think this is something that we need to nurture everywhere in order to um, allow more people to develop their mental abilities to its, to its fullest, for sure. As, as we come to the end, uh, I'm going to ask a question I think is often asked of you, and so um, it may interest you or not, and that's simply... We're now at a point of having gone so far in deep learning that we now know what we don't know. That's the famous business about knowledge. Yes, yes. So this is a period of pause. It's not pause. There's a full intense effort, but a sense of discouragement in some cases. No. No. What? Where are we? What don't we know? The naysayers are saying this. Okay. <laughs> okay. And there are probably a few of them. That's right. Uh, they're saying what and. Tell me the answer to those naysayers. So some people may be feeling a little bit um, of injustice in the way uh, that things have developed in favor of deep learning. Oh, and yeah. So much investment has gone in there yes. that uh, you know, there could be a temptation to say, oh, look, it doesn't work here. We've achieved so much. I mean, the progress has been amazing. Yes. But as a scientist, my job is to figure out what are the limitations of what we have done, what are the weaknesses, and then plan a course towards solving those problems. Right. It's normal that I talk about the limitations. There's nothing new there. Yes. I've always been doing that. If you look at my papers from the early 90s, I've been a person pointing at the problems, including, you know, and mostly the problems with the whatever neural nets were there at the time. Right. So for me, there's nothing new, but it's just that the social interpretation now is, oh, look, you know, nets don't work. Uh, we have to invent something new. And for sure, we need to 
clearly explore many different directions. And I have a lot of respect for my colleagues who bring other ideas and I get a lot of inspiration from them. Right. Uh, but I think there's a bit of a social battle here, schools of thoughts and so on. And, and I think we should step away from this and, and just think about the science and understanding of what are we, it's not about like who's right or who's wrong. We need to get to down to the truth of what is intelligence. Um, and so maybe to go a little bit towards the specifics, mm -hmm. uh, I gave a lecture, um, a special, what's called Posner lecture at NeurIPS, uh, kind of invited presentation on what I perceived to be where we have to go next with deep learning okay. in order to go from sort of low level cognition, perception and low level action that we've made a lot of progress on towards um, high level cognition, conscious processing, the kinds of things that classically I were trying to do. Um, so the good news is we now have a lot of intellectual tools, both coming from brain sciences who study, people who study consciousness in a scientific way, not, not the, the, the mystical yes, thing. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, on, in our camp, the tools like attention mechanisms in neural nets, which can come together, I think, to move, off, move, move us in a sort of completely new territory. So that's your answer to the naysayers. It's actually a, quite a good moment yes, now. Yes, yes. And For researchers, it's exciting. That's got to be the last word. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks to you.